I think this is episode 23 now. Today, I'm actually really excited to have a guest on. Um, colleague of mine, but honestly, at this point, just a good friend, uh, Tony Scavuzzo, um, yep. who is a expert, um, definitely an expert, I think, in computational chemistry. But honestly, he really just knows a lot of things that I like picking his brain about. And so today, I'm really happy to have him on because I think we'll have a very fun episode today. So, Tony, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? You know, another day of grad school, another dollar. Um, <laughs> I know another you, fifty cents. Let's be honest. <laughs> might even be less than that. Uh, but we put the work in today. Mm. You know, um, you weren't in lab today, but I know as we'll talk about later, is you do a lot of work from home because you are the mm. computational expert. Um, and one of the perks, <laughs> I think, uh, it'll be exciting today because I know a lot of people. I mean. First of all, people don't even know chemistry, but now we're going to talk about computational chemistry a little bit later on today. So it'll be really fun, but we'll, we'll start with this because I know I know you personally. Um, you're the born and raised in Ohio. Actually, no, you don't like me saying that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> he spends like a like a couple months in Ohio and I you know he's from Ohio. Yes. Um, no, but in all seriousness, no, if, if, uh, just, you know, introduce yourself and you know, your, your background a little bit. And then, you know, mm -hmm. how you actually really got into chemistry in the first place, just all that. So go ahead and. Sure. Well, like you said, my name's Tony Scavuzzo and I'm from Gainesville, Georgia, not Ohio. <laughs> and uh, I would say that uh, honestly, the way I got into chemistry is probably not the best reason to get into chemistry, but it's funny enough. I, um, as a senior in high school, I was trying to decide what major to get into. I just knew I liked math and science and I was nice. like shopping around and I never actually made up my mind. Um, and there was a point where I was taking high school, uh, AP chemistry and I was having a lot of fun with it. I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I could go be a chemist. And then I thought to myself, no. No, I should I should probably do something hard. I don't want to like go with an easy answer like that. <laughs> Which is and funny because the, AP Chemistry is arguably the hardest course in high school. That's what I found out. the uh, The AP scores got back, and I was the only one who passed. And not only did I pass, I passed with flying colors. And I was like, "Oh, yeah. oh, chemistry is not easy. I'm talented. Oh, that's a really good reason to pick a major, actually." Right. So I basically just picked it because it was a science uh, class that I had a lot of fun in, and I found out that apparently I was talented in. Did you have a good I teacher? That seemed like, like a no. No, <laughs> I, thought, I find that pretty no. odd because I feel like many people that go into the STEM fields, they kind of go into it because they had a really good like professor or teacher in high school. But that's not the case mm. with you, which is interesting. No. I had some good, um, I had a good chemistry teacher, but she wasn't the reason that I went into chemistry. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I had a great calculus teacher and he certainly inspired me to look for something math heavy. And that's what I was actually about to get to, which is that then I get my chemistry degree, I go to grad school. And the thing is, is that I picked sci a science because I wanted something super math heavy. It's my favorite subject, Yeah. but I didn't want to go work for an insurance company, so I didn't major in it. Yeah. And uh, it turns out that when you're a graduate student in organic chemistry, that the most you ever do is divide and that <laughs> you usually have some sort of spreadsheet do that for you. And uh, it really, really started to grate on me that I had no math to do during my uh, career in chemistry. Which is part of the reason I went into computational chemistry because it kind of let me flex those math muscles. Yeah. So I, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the worst, I mean, I guess a true organic chemist is like dimensional analysis, maybe, probably, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the hardest you have to really get into, but it can be cumbersome. But um, so like the organic chemistry is hard in its own ways and not in ways that I particularly enjoy, truth be told. <laughs> yeah. What, so what about, but like, what about, you know, like mathematics in general, that really kind of spoke to you. I know you didn't like major in it, but like, like you said, like you're always like interested in mathematics. So like, what about it? Like kind of interests you the most, do you think? Oh, a couple of different things. I will say I'm good at math and that always, yeah. you know, people who are good at math tend to be attracted to it. Sure. Um, but I like the fact that it always had hard answers 
even if those hard answers were a little bit complicated sometimes, like when an entire function is the answer instead of a single value. Mm. Um, but there was a definite right or wrong answer at the end of whatever exercise I was doing. And it also was a great place for the whole never give up mentality to really shine mm. where you can really just throw yourself against a problem over and over again until you figure it out, no matter how challenging it is. Mm. And the further into math you get, the more it just ends up being more and more like that. So like in, uh, Calculus 2, where they're teaching you like eight different integration techniques, they don't tell you which one do you use. You just start trying them. And one fails, you try again. That one fails, you try again. Yeah. And it's kind of satisfying to kind of like bash against it until eventually you win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So something that's it got a competitive drive to it for me. Yeah. Something that's interesting about it is like, especially, I don't, I wouldn't even say high school, but definitely when you get to like Calc 1, Calc 2, you do learn a lot of um, integration techniques. I mean, um, derivatives, mm. all these kind of things. And it's hard to put into perspective because I, like, I, like I have an engineering background too. So I had to really go, I had to go pretty far deep into like differential mm. equations, but it's hard to say how important like things like calculus actually are. I mean, it's hard to express exactly how much they can govern or model basically anything in your life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, as complicated as it as it can be it really is the i mean math just is right like there is like it just is mm -hmm. um it, it's hard to it. it you know calculus trigonometry like they just are <laughs> they just are there's no yeah. there's, <laughs> they don't have to they don't have to obey anything like they just there's there's a know. very satisfying expression of truth that happens at the end of a hard math problem mm -hmm. where it's not like me regurgitating a memorized fact it is you gave me a set uh, system and here's the truth that evolved out of it right um also too you know you, uh, you went to high school in gainesville georgia right which is um yes. backwoods georgia northeast georgia i think yeah a bit backwards yeah yeah like two hours north of atlanta or something like that right good memory yep um but i also wanted to just briefly discuss because you also are huge into music and music theory because i definitely want to discuss that too today because i think You'll be you'll be the first guest, I think, that has well, not music, not deep, so, but like just yeah, instruments in general. Don't sell me up. Uh, don't sell me too strong. I have a passable understanding of music theory. Fair enough. I won't. Uh, I won't call you a music theory expert, but at least to someone like me who's never played an instrument, you definitely are. Mm. Um, but I do want to practice musician at yeah. best is what I would describe myself and as. I, I think that's fair. Um, so for anyone take, don't, you know, I am, I don't play any instruments. So, you know, take my words for granted <laughs> or with a grain of salt, I should say. Um, but, you know, so you're in the band because I also want to talk about your, your Clemson a little bit, but. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you were in the band. So do you mind telling us like what instruments you, you played and um, sure. things of that nature? Yeah, so I, uh, like you mentioned, I went uh, to Clemson University for is it Clemson University or University of Clemson? I'm not even sure. <laughs> um, I don't even know. I went to Clemson for my undergrad, um, and I did play trumpet in the uh, marching band for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually did not stay in the marching band for the whole uh, four years of undergraduate, so there are definitely better people to talk to about that. I have a lot of friends who were there the whole time. Sure. Um, I eventually ended up leaving the marching band primarily because, funny enough, I wanted to go tutor calculus. <laughs> um, and I just didn't have enough um, time in the Same. day to do, like, my actual degree marching band and tutoring all at the same time and i don't regret the decision i really enjoyed tutoring calculus it was a lot of fun yeah something that but... really opened my eyes is um because i mean i come from a strictly like athlete background my brother and i like played soccer and you know, we played a sport basically every semester in high school i never touched an instrument so coming to you know houston where I basically all my lab mates play an instrument except for me. It's, it's at least what it seems like. So what what I thought was really interesting is how much time you guys got to put into the instruments. I mean, Oh yeah, you know? that's, that's why I stopped. It's just, it consumes an inordinate amount of time. You mm -hmm. have to have an insane passion for it to keep up with it um, enough, long enough to get good, let alone your whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, like the that's why part of why I say I'm not like a, a real musician because I eventually decided to put down the trumpet and focus on my studies instead. Yeah, 
But how, com- uh, now, how competitive was the band at Clemson? Because I remember you told me. Very. Okay. Well, okay. There are met. Uh, there are a lot of bands that are extremely competitive. Um, Clemson's focus was less on being like this super elite marching band and more focused on being like the how to put this um basically the the spirit of a football game mm. we were the the most important elements i think in getting people hyped for a game besides you know the actual team itself right and i think that's so it was primarily about that. yeah like we were less interested in like belaboring the the perfect arpeggio and more interested in just getting a whole bunch of people that were excited and passionate about being there and willing to put in the hours. Yeah. I think that there definitely is a, at the college level, it seems to me as someone like from the outside, like either you have a very, very competitive band at the college level for like actually competing or Mm. you go to a top 10 football school and you know, you're there kind of more or less getting lit. Which is still competitive. I don't know. You, there are definitely both. Like the the one that mm. immediately comes to mind for any band kid would be Ohio State. Is mm-hmm. obviously a football team uh, school, but their band is top notch. So you're not one or the other for sure. Okay. All right. So that's definitely something that I, I didn't know about. Um. So you're at Clemson. You know, you're in the band, but you also weren't chemistry or mathematics, right? You were mechanical engineering, I think, right? First. Yeah. It was actually I. Uh, I did start off as a mechanical engineer. I made that decision about halfway through my high school senior year. And it was only after the AP scores got back at the end of the last semester that I made the decision to switch to chemistry. Yeah. And I managed to make that switch um, about halfway through the summer. So by the time I arrived at Clemson, I was a chemistry major, but Mm -hmm. I was accepted to Clemson as a mechanical engineer. Very, uh, very interesting. Was Clemson pretty lenient on letting you, I mean, I guess they were, right? Just letting you switch right into there um i believe don't quote me on this i believe the rule was basically if they had room then they'd be happy to let you switch Mm. but if they didn't if they had accepted the the cap of the number of uh, mechanical engineering students they wanted that year they weren't going to make an exception for someone who was switching majors yeah because i know like obviously some people might not know this but you know the engineering school and like the the physical science schools like there's Two different entities, right? Those are not the same thing. Mm. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the other way around. The chemistry department was yeah, yeah, and they and it, to yeah, and it, students. yeah. We 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 know what you meant. Um, but so tell us a little bit about the chemistry at at Clemson. You know, like um, so you were studying that, and you know, were you doing any research at the time, or I was doing some research. I did some research under uh, Professor Joseph Thrasher, and that was mm. in fluorine chemistry all sorts of really crazy energetic reactions for making fluoropolymers uh, was Mm. one of the big targets in the lab. Um, Bit dangerous. I lost my, I I, I lost my interest in that after finishing my uh, undergraduate, Mm. but uh, it was a great department. I had a lot of fun and you commented about um, a lot of times there's some uh, teacher that really inspired you. And that's like it at Clemson. That's where I found some um, chemistry professors that really inspired me to mm. kind of go eye of the tiger and uh, do the best that I could in chemistry. Right. So, um, so that's kind of your, I guess your first exposure to experimental chemistry. So what was the, what was mm-hmm. some of the decisions like leading up to going into graduate school? Like, so, you know, what was that? When did you, when did you decide that, you know, actually graduate school might be for me? Because again, you still hadn't really been introduced to computational chemistry yet. So you really still aren't mm. even at that level yet. So what were those some of those decisions leading up to that? Well, I originally intended to be an organometallic chemist, and I still am. I just mm. imagined myself being in an experimental one first. Um, and honestly, I had always imagined myself going to grad school. Uh, it's mm. just like the, the way I'd always imagined myself as even a high schooler. Um, both my parents went to grad school, so to some extent that may have uh, guided that decision. Right. Um, then there's also just the fact that um, rationally, I knew that if you have an undergraduate in chemistry, oftentimes you are doing experiments for some sort of higher up who's like the the principal scientist. Mm. And I found it a lot more appealing to go get my PhD and go be that principal scientist deciding on the experiments that will be run each day in the laboratory. Mm. Um, in that sense, I saw the 
the person with the PhD is more of the the scientist, quote unquote, because they were the ones who were undergoing the scientific uh, process, formulating a hypothesis and devising an experiment to accomplish it. Interesting. So how did you, because initially you went to Princeton. So, you know, what were the, mm-hmm. some decisions like kind of get going to Princeton? Um, you know, were there other schools involved or, by the way, can you hear, yes. can, can you hear Mary Wash in the background? I just want to make sure you like, nope. okay. All right. Sure, sure. Um, so the, uh, first of all, the decision to really kind of shoot for the stars for grad school was made, well, not made for me. Uh, I was inspired to make that decision by one of my uh, organic chemistry professors, the one who taught me advanced organic chemistry. Hmm. Um, and honestly, like when I commented that I wanted to go to grad school, he just kind of pulled me aside. He's like, you got to go for a good one. Like you got it. You have what it takes. Like we believe and you go for it. And it kind of shocked me that someone just wanted me to know that. I was like, oh, okay. If <laughs> if you really feel that way about me after seeing my advanced organic chemistry, I will go apply to some good grad schools. Fair enough. Um, uh, I applied, if I remember correctly, to um, Princeton, Wisconsin, Illinois, um, MIT, I think Columbia, but it's been a while. And I was writing out my application to UNC Chapel Hill when my first letter of acceptance got through. So I uh, immediately put down uh, the application and said I'd never again. <laughs> and was that was that one Princeton? No, the first one was actually Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Madison. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. I really, I almost went there. I really, really liked what I saw when I visited. Um, yeah. I really liked the research that was going on there. The city was pleasant, things like that. So what, what shows you over uh, middle of nowhere, New Jersey versus uh, <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin? Uh, well, first of all, uh, what kind of appealed to me was that you, it was your quote, middle of nowhere. Um, I came from a town of 900 people, um, Claremont, Georgia, and I went to, like you mentioned, undergrad in Clemson. And Clemson, if I remember correctly, had a population of around 30,000. So I found places with a population closer to that more appealing to me because I didn't want to go to a big city for graduate school. I thought I would find that overwhelming and unappealing. And now you're in and Houston. And now <laughs> here I am in Houston, population 7 million. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes you uh, sometimes you don't know where life's going to lead you. Yeah, fair enough. Um, um, so I did find that appealing, the sort of small town vibes. Um, I'll be honest, the city's pretty classy as a whole. It just kind of felt cool to be there. The architecture is honestly fascinating. It's got um, a history dating back to, I believe, pre-Revolutionary War. At Princeton? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, it's very interesting. I think Princeton, we've talked about this before, and I think this is a pretty interesting discussion too. Not just Princeton, but like the the upper echelon schools those uh, ivy league schools it's almost mm-hmm. like it's first of all like it's top ed- i mean it is cutting edge education like it is it is a top like mm-hmm. many much of the research not just in chemistry but um the ivy league schools like they really do have a lot going on for them but that being said it's almost like you're afraid to admit you're going to schools because you don't want to come off as pretentious, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is very odd to me. Like I remember, in, I, remember I don't like I don't tell girls I go on a date that with that I go to a uh, Princeton. I tell them I go to UH. Yeah, which is I mean, why is it that? Why do Why do you think it is that way? Because I remember like in, in elementary school, like in, even like middle school, when like because like I'm from. Uh, cause I'm, I'm, you know, I'm from suburbs of Pennsylvania. So, you know, UPenn, I don't know, is Drexel considered Ivy league? I don't know if it is. Dre- I don't know. Uh, all I can tell you is that Ivy league is technically a football league. Okay. Um, not yeah, a uh, yeah, designation it's not. of prestige per se. It's just an old football league full yeah. of nerds. So but I'll just say, we could just say, keep it simple. Cause UPenn is Ivy league yeah. and you know, UPenn is Pens- Ivy league, yeah. and so it's like, you know, ideally you always want to go to you know, UPenn is just like the, the top of the top, right? If you're from suburbs of Pennsylvania, you know, you, you yeah, yeah. Go to UPenn. So why, like, why do you think it is that? I don't know. Like, you always want to go there. Like, you always, like, you always say you want to go there. People are always hyping up, and then you're actually there. You're actually a student there, and it's like, yeah, I don't like to admit I, might, I go to UPenn or something like that. You know. 
Uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I can't give you a, a super informed answer on that. Sure. I do blame Big Bang Theory just a little bit, though. <laughs> uh, well, it definitely theory. doesn't paint a uh, doesn't paint a very uh, charismatic picture. Fair enough. Of the people who go to those two sorts of universities, because that's that, that's about MIT, right? That's where all those people go to. Well, I don't know. I don't know where Big Bang I, was. I, Sheldon honestly always annoyed me. I got to be honest. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, anyway, I feel like someone was associated with MIT, and it may have been where they all worked or something. But I didn't watch it very much. Yeah. Because it irritated me. Yeah. So any, but I mean, I mean, Princeton is a. I, I've actually never, I never even driven to the campus. I mean, I've only seen like. I mean, it seems beautiful. Um, it is beautiful. It's a little odd because you'll go past one building and it's pre-revolutionary war. Yeah. And then you go to the next one and it's like the weird love child of like Salvador Dali <laughs> and like the, the paint section of Lowe's. <laughs> I actually went to his museum, by the way, in Tampa Bay. It's actually a really cool museum. Salvador okay. Dali. Um, highly recommend anyone and checking out his work. Um, the, the architecture ranges anywhere from ancient to like postmodern, right? Very odd. And I don't know why it's just like Princeton being in New Jersey is like kind of odd because I feel like such a weird conception about New Jersey because it's like people. <laughs> well, people, Jersey Shore doesn't help, right? Exactly, right? When people think of Jersey, they think of like the Jersey Shore, and it's like, dude, like that is like not even like proper Jersey. I think <laughs> I, I cannot. I cannot paint any picture of Jersey for you because the entire time I was there, I just basically kept myself in Princeton. Fair enough. Um, so, but it's the Garden State. I can tell you that much. Right. Um, so, I was just gonna say. I mean, at least in chemistry, I don't know. I don't really know about any of that subject. It's really your PI, anyways. Like, I mean, the where you get your degree. Surely, I mean, I'm sure it has some stake in your future. But ultimately, it's gonna be your PI. I think. I think that's mostly. Eh, I've heard you... like I've heard varying things about that as someone who has never sought employment nor employed someone after grad school. I'm not mm. the right person to ask about that. But I will say I've heard mixed comments on it. And the one that kind of was the most convincing to me is that um rationally the PI that you worked for is the most important part. Mm -hmm. However, there's going always going to be that little um, sub uh, self not self conscious subconscious tug when you see like a really prestigious university associated with some applicant. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously, like you know, you went so you go to Princeton. Um, I guess I'm going to talk to I'll talk to Brad later on in the podcast too. I'm excited to bring him on as well. But what initially drew you to uh, you know Brad's group? Um, what were you initially working on? And then how did that transition go into computational chemistry? I think that's this is where the bulk of our discussion will be. Sure. Uh, so honestly, uh, lots of different things attracted me to Brad's group. What attracted me to Princeton as a whole was the fact that there were a lot of organometallic groups there, which is what I wanted to do. I uh, found that to be the most interesting subject when I was an undergraduate. Real, real and, quick about this. Can we just explain what like organometallic chemistry is maybe to some people? Yeah, yeah. So organometallic chemistry is the union between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. Um, normally, these molecules are largely organic molecules, but they have one or two transition metal cores in their center. Mm. And those transition metal cores dominate the reactivity, but you have to have the organic chemistry know-how to understand the way that the rest of the molecule impacts that transition metal core. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the fact that the goal of these transition metal uh, complexes is usually to perform organic chemistry. So it really requires you to have an understanding of that metal core in organic chemistry, but also the purpose and um, design of that organometallic molecule, which is a lot of organic chemistry as well. Yeah. And just to add to and that... And a couple of rules that are specific to organometallic chemistry. Yeah. Just to add to that real quick, you know, when we when you talk about organic chemistry, you know, we're talking about the chemistry of like, you know, carbon, hydrogen, mm -hmm. nitrogen, oxygen. Um that's all I mean, the that's, uh first and second row elements except helium. Yeah. And then transition metals typically, at least in our context, you know, we're looking with we're looking at uh nickel, palladium, mm -hmm. copper, 
uh, not our group. I mean, Iron too. Um, mm. Not and then not our group specifically, but you know, platinum, golds, is it silver transition metal. Yes. Mm, is it okay? Yep. Yep. Um, our, well, the all the metals you're listing right now are what are called the late transition metals. Mm. So the metals more towards the right side of the periodic table. Mm. Um, and they have their own uh, properties. One of which being that they are less oxophilic, meaning that they react with oxygen or water a little bit less uh, pronouncedly. Yeah. Uh, as a consequence, um, they often have applications where atoms like oxygen are present. Mm. Uh, which is why we're mostly interested in them because we do chemistry like that. Uh, okay. Then there is a whole different other speciality being the early metals. And it requires a very high level of precision when you're doing your experimental chemistry because even the smallest amount of oxygen or water will wipe out your whole reaction due to how reactive those elements are towards those uh, substances. Yeah. So I just want to do a brief aside of a grand metal, just mm. give some people some context of what we're talking about yep. here. Um, the transition so anyway. metals, the, the easiest way to describe them was that if you have your periodic table that has that little weird bench at the bottom, Yeah, it's all those elements right there. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, you know, working with Brad, you know, working organometallics. So go ahead uh, and kind of continue that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the things that interested me about the Caro Lab would be some of its prior research, which is in ligand design. I was uh, super excited about that. So that would be the design of the organic component that is attached to the metal and uh, understanding how tweaking that organic part affects the metal is central to the entire field of organometallics. Yeah. And the, the idea that we were directly manipulating that, and that's the part that we were most interested in uh, making new discoveries in was exciting to me. Whereas another sort of philosophy of organometallic chemistry would be to take existing organic compounds and mix them with metals in an attempt to do new chemistry. Mm -hmm. I found this sort of frontier of discovering new modifications to transition metals to be especially exciting. Mm -hmm. And so do you mind briefly talking about your experimental work in the, the Carroll lab and mm -hmm. um, kind of bring it to where you are now, really, I guess. Yeah, uh, so my prior work, my uh, first project was uh, about the um, copolymerization of ethylene with polar copolymers using nickel, which is a lot of jargon. But basically, we are creating designer plastics using a nickel organometallic catalyst. Uh, so I did lots of oxygen and water-free chemistry. I use a um, device called a glove box where the entire atmosphere is pure nitrogen and you have to like bring things through an airlock to uh, bring things in and put them back through the airlock to take things out. You have two giant rubber gloves that you reach inside with to uh, manipulate. Um, so lots of specialist techniques like that, um, or worked with high pressure chemistry to create these plastics. Um, and honestly, the re reason I started transitioning towards um, computational chemistry was a little bit of a failing on my own part, which is that in all of science, you have a lot of failures. And I found I had a very difficult time emotionally self-regulating during those moments. Mm. Um, it's just completely natural when you're a scientist for a lot of things to not work. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm the sort of personality where I go home and it haunts me at night and like, maybe I'm just not good enough at using a balance or like, may, maybe I like, forgot didn't use the airlock the right number of times or something like that or i start to like create uh like go crazy and kind it's of like chase myself scenarios. in circles right yeah like gaslighting myself into thinking i did everything wrong um where with computational chemistry once i started doing it what i found very exciting about it is that it was easier for me to self-regulate about these things. Yeah. When something doesn't work with a computer program, there's no part of me that wonders, did I hit the, hit the enter button just wrong enough or something? <laughs> when something goes wrong with a program, I'm like, all right, let's figure out what's wrong with this program. And then you go into debugging mode, and that's something I'm very comfortable with because it's got that sort of mathematical precision I love so much. Yeah. I think I think uh, some of the – there's definitely – and we talk about this a lot, but I'm going to say it again because it really is so true. Like – because I, I got to remind myself sometimes, like working with iron, like 
just because your chemistry doesn't work doesn't make you a bad person, right? So like, it's true. That's it's very like, important to remember. I mean, we, I mean, not just our group, but you know, so many groups are at the the front tier of new science, and many things just don't work. They just don't. The, the frontier usually doesn't work. Um, and that's okay. If it was easy to do, we would have found it by now. Right. Um. So it's okay if it doesn't work, and I got to remind myself too. Um, oh yeah, every scientist needs to remind themselves of that, and honestly. That's why I say it's a little bit of a failing on my part, because honestly, to be a scientist, I should be able to go home and just accept that the research didn't work today. Yeah. And I found that easier to do with a computer program personally. Mm -hmm. So let's let's um, hop into this now, because I'm, I'm I'm always excited to talk to you about computational chemistry, because you really do know a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And now it wasn't easy for you to get here to this point, to be <laughs> no, a computational I expert. Uh, I had to teach myself a lot. Um, yeah. Um, do you want to... Let's, let's start with this. What is... I guess the first question is, can we, what's the general basis for, well, in our context, organometallics and what we study, can mm -hmm. you explain computational chemistry for our purposes? And, you know, how did you, how did you learn it all basically too? Like, mm -hmm. how to, like what, what were the steps to kind of doing that? So for your first question, I have a two-part answer mm. um, for what is computational chemistry at its core chemistry is governed by physics. There's um, attractive yeah. forces between electrons and protons, repulsive forces between electrons and electrons, repulsive forces between protons and protons. And in principle, if you can track down all the mathematics for that physics accurately enough, you can find create a computer that will just say what the chemistry is going to do. And that's the point of computational chemistry mm. at its core. It's not a very satisfying answer as far as, okay, why do we care? But that's what's going on inside the computer. It's just crunching the numbers on all the complicated physics, the quantum mechanics, to figure out what is this atom or molecule or group of molecules going to do next. Which I think is a great answer. I think that is important. <laughs> um, as far as why we care about it, um, it allows you to do a couple of different things. First of all, it allows you to run a lot of experiments very quickly, even experiments that would oftentimes be unrealistic in a laboratory. Yeah. So one of the purposes of my project is to um, predict the behavior of around 100 different catalysts. And if I want to do that experimentally, I have to be an army of like 20 grad students. Yeah. Um, but computationally, it's a completely reasonable task to get done in a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in addition, computational chemistry does more than just predict answers. It gives reasons for why things are going to happen. So with chemistry, oftentimes you'll find a productive result and we'll go, well, great. Now we have something to talk about. Why did it do that, though? And when you have all the mathematics and physics at your fingertips, it's a lot easier to start to like interrogate and ask why did that happen? Because you can kind of pull up all the different contributions to the physics and figure out which one was most important today. Mm -hmm. So it gives I... you a rationale for why the chemistry works that way, which provides reasoning for future experiments, which is one of the main goals of science. Yeah, I think one of the definitely one of the toughest questions to ask yourself when doing computational chemistry um, is, you know, how deep into the weeds do I need to get to answer my <laughs> question? Um, yes. uh, which, and you know, honestly, what, half the point of learning all the different things is so that you need, you know, how deep you need to get for a given day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is, I mean, the abundance of, of computational literature that's out there is just, I mean, yes. beyond me. And most overwhelming, of it, in fact, it's, it's, you can't even keep up with all of it. Um, mm. But so how did you, you know, get into it? what initially interests you about it? Cause I know we, as we discussed, you definitely have a interest in mathematics in general. Um, but certainly, I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even hear about computational chemistry until I met you. So like, this is like, I would, it's not an, it's not a new field. Actually, mm. actually, you know, I don't know. Is it a new field? Hmm. Yeah, it, hitting the mainstream is kind of new. It's yeah. uh, it's new for an organometallic group like us to be doing computational chemistry. Mm. It would have been a niche field a while ago. And it's uh, the field itself has existed for a while, actually. Um, some of the first, uh, I think the Hartree-Fock equations, some of, the, some of the first computational chemistry equations um, premiered just barely after quantum mechanics itself. 
Yeah. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not a science when, historian. When did, con- when did, when was like quantum mechanics like discovered? I don't even know. I got to look this up on top of my head. Quantum I mechanics, gotta... I believe, was around the 40s. Quantum. 40s and 50s. I'm looking this up now because I'm just, I'm curious for my own. The time of Albert Einstein is the easiest answer, though. Right, I guess, yeah. He is a key contributor. Uh, quantum mechanics discovered. Um, yeah, so first used in, yeah, born, born, born Oppenheimer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 1924. Uh, the, the title oh, 20, of the paper. So very early. The, ni- the very first paper was Zero Quantum Mechanique, which is, uh, I'm not the surprised German, that it's German. German for four quantum mechanics. It's funny. Anyway. Mm. Um, okay, so even older than I uh, imagined it. But uh, so point being, the field itself is actually quite old. And a lot of the techniques I use today were developed in the 80s, actually. Mm. Um, just the fact that the I'm no, I am formally a organometallics uh, student using these techniques is more of what's new. And I'm not sure how long ago that started to become normal. Mm-hmm. Um, but what got me into it was honestly a little bit of luck. Um, yeah. I was working on my nickel catalyzed polymerization project, and we had a question that was not easily answered with practical experimental chemistry. I did my best. I did this whole series of experiments. And then Brad asked me to model it computationally to like kind of get some hard answers on which step of the process was causing us problems that day. And I just immediately fell in love. I adored the mathematics at play. I adored just like spending several hours a day setting up calculations, spending another several hours processing the results. Um, And when I finished it, I finished that project, I was actually quite sad. Um, And I (laughs) quite, I very distinctly remember that I turned in a progress report that was purely computational, no experimental work at all. And that was bad of me because I was not supposed to be a computational chemist. I was just having too much fun. And Brad commented, okay, but next next report, you need to do some more experimental chemistry. I don't want you to be a pure computational chemist. And And, uh, here I am. (laughs) That's okay, though, because it's, uh, I mean, it's so nice having you around the lab and we have a, I mean, I don't really have many computational chemistry questions anymore, but when I briefly read them, it's always nice to bounce ideas off you and hear hear from you. Um, but um, but it was over COVID then, too, right? Like it was also that yeah. was actually two years before COVID. Okay, and then that was the next part of the story. During COVID, uh, we changed my project over a little bit. He decided mm-hmm. that it would be fine to kind of do what I was already doing, but accelerate it with computational chemistry. And that was the first moment I had to really dig my teeth into it and really enjoy it. Do you want to um, briefly discuss your computational projects? I know you, we briefly touched on it, but I kind of want to dig into it a little bit, what exactly you're doing. Uh, I guess the the easiest summary of that would be um, that I'm trying to predict what organic fragments, when attached to nickel, will result in the best uh, um, custom plastics for consumers. Mm. Uh, Best, obviously, being a summary of a whole bunch of nuanced polymerization chemistry topics. But the core of it was just, let's try a whole bunch of different organic molecules attached to nickel and see which ones have the best results for this project. And Um, I think think it's important to discuss this too briefly, because when we talk about, because you're working copolymerizations, so mm-hmm. we're talking about the polymerization of ethylene, which and carbon monoxide, right? I believe. No, um, Not, there are oh there methyl are acrylate. Who study that methyl acrylate is what right. study. Yeah. Um. So a. And in general, it's difficult to incorporate polar monomers into a polymer. It's just that's just a generality. Yeah, well, Difficult to incorporate polar co-monomers into a non-polar None. polymer. It's perfectly easy to make a polymer out of methyl acrylate by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you were hinting at right there, molecules can be categorized into polar and non-polar. Polar molecules are molecules where the electrons have been tugged to one side. So mm-hmm. you have a positive side and a negative side. And then non-polar molecules are just molecules where that didn't happen. And all the molecules of the universe can be kind of be categorized on that spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the big um, consequences of that would be solubility. 
So mm. oil is nonpolar, water is polar. They do not mix. They just separate out into two different phases. And it's kind of interesting. Lots of things do that, not just liquids. Uh, if you have a nonpolar plastic, then nonpolar gases can travel relatively easy through it because they can dissolve in and dissolve out just fine. Mm. But polar gases struggle to do so. And the opposite is also true. So one immediate application of this that springs to mind for me is that by changing whether your plastic is polar or nonpolar, you're changing what gases are able to travel through it, which could have pretty dramatic consequences, for example, for food packaging, mm. where oxygen and water traveling through the plastic film can cause your food to spoil. Right. And yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. That was a good uh, distinction that you made too. Um, yeah, just so in general, yeah, yeah. So incorporating polar monomers into a non-polar monomer is traditionally difficult. Yes. Um, and ideally, the and the idea of your project is to what changes can be made to a ligand to incorporate more polar monomer into a non-polar monomer. Right. That's the. Yep. That's a good summary. Um. And that so, would be what that's what I was uh, kind of wrapping up and to make the plastic better. Yeah. And uh we I had an excellent discussion with Ava Harth about uh you know what is a plastic and uh because polymers because people toss around the word plastic too 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 easily, I think. Yes, technically speaking, I'm interested in more than just plastics. Polymers is the correct word, mm -hmm. but not everyone knows what a polymer is. And, they usually be categorized into plastics and rubbers, though. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of another discussion for the day. What I am curious about is, I'm depending on how much time you have, I'd love to get into the knit and grit of, you know, what is computational chemistry? And it mm -hmm. depends, it depends, kind of on the, depends on how much time you have, but, you know. Sure. It's early, earliest beginnings, I, I should say. And actually, not earliest beginnings, but I should say um, is what are the fundamental principles and equations that we work with. Oh, you want to get into the weeds. I would um, love to, because I think one, it helps my understanding, but two, you know, I, uh, people are interested in this, you know, mm -hmm. this is a platform for them to hear about it from an expert. So sure. um, let's, let's get into it. So what are, what is the fundamental equations and principles of, you know, computational chemistry? Well, the fundamental equation for most computational chemistry would be the, um, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is a framework that allows you to calculate what's called a wave function for any given system. And that wave function contains inside of it all of the information about the system. It will predict anything and everything that molecule can do. Mm -hmm. um, and fundamentally, the purpose of most computational chemistry is to solve that equation. The twist is that for any molecule with more than one electron, which is most of them, uh, the Schrodinger equation is unsolvable. It's a mathematical, a mathematically unsolvable equation. It's like having a system of two equations and three variables. There's just nothing you can do to completely solve it. And um, real quick, so about the Schrodinger equation, mm -hmm. the components of that, right? So I mean, we get to, it's basically the subatomic the subatomic or atomic level so like the the components that make it up are i i think if i remember correctly mm -hmm. the attraction and repulsion energy or the all the attractive energies of a atom mm -hmm. all the repulsive energies and that's pretty much it the kinetic energy wait is that it kinetic energy yes and the kinetic so the three right there's three basically but then there's kind of subcomponents of that but like those are the three right yeah, the, um, the simplest version of the Schrodinger equation, which is also the least useful, mm. is HE equals psi E, where H is an operator, psi is a, the wave function, and E is the energy mm -hmm. of a given solution to the wave function. Um, there can be more than one solution, each with its corresponding energies, and H, the operator, contains all of the terms relevant to the energy of the system. Yeah. And the simplest version of H is negative one half del squared plus V. Negative one half del squared is simply the kinetic energy term. It's very similar to uh, kinetic energy is equal to um, one half MV squared. Um, 
then V simply encapsulates every potential energy term. Mm. Normally, those potential energy terms will be nuclear repulsion between two different nuclei, which are positively charged, electron-electron repulsion between two different electrons, which are both negatively charged, and electron-nuclear attraction, positive attracts negative. It, it can include other terms, though. For example, um, the Schrodinger equation has a different solution if you take a molecule and place it inside of an electric field. That electric mm. field will uh, will cause a new term to appear inside of H, the Hamiltonian. And like like you mentioned before, many times wh why we can't solve the Schrodinger equation, like when we get higher levels, or when we get to two electrons, not even just two more, electrons or more, <laughs> is because it's the instantaneous repulsion energy, right, of the two electrons, right? Is that the... So the instantaneous repulsion energy is a problem, yes, but it is not the fundamental reason that it cannot be solved. Okay, what's the fundamental reason then? Uh, honestly, the it's just uh, just like how to a system of equations with two equations and three variables can't be solved. You just don't okay. have enough pieces, in a sense, to find a solution analytically. Is it is is the Schrodinger? I always confuse this. Is the Schrodinger equation the one where like you? can know an electron's velocity, but not its, like, position, or, like, you know its position, not its velocity, something like that, right? What, am I confusing So you're else? thinking, uh, you were thinking of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which uh, okay. says that you cannot simultaneously know with unlimited precision the momentum and uh, location of an object, any object, including you and me, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, what's really critical about that is the unlimited precision part. If you allow some level of error then you are allowed to know both the position and the momentum of something. That's mm. fine. Um, and for objects as large as you and me, that's fine. Because if we are, if we like under evaluate our momentum by like, I, I don't know, a factor of one billionth, mm -hmm. no one will care. No yeah. one will notice. But that um, change in size is noticeable at the quantum mechanical level, so it becomes relevant. Okay. Uh, effectively, as long as you stay above the size of uh, like a nanoparticle, then the errors involved are so small that you don't need to worry about it. But once you go beyond, uh, lower than a nanoparticle, those errors become comparable to the things you're measuring. I see. Okay, so the Schrodinger um, equation is mm -hmm. can't be solved above... Two electrons or more. So yep. this kind of is a good segue back into, you know, what, what computation allows us to do, basically. Mm -hmm. So what's nice, though, is that there is a principle, the uh, variational principle, which says that if you have a trial wave function, so just a function you made up, and you put it into the uh, Schrodinger equation in the place of where the solution is supposed to be, you will get an energy. And that energy will be higher than the real energy of the system because your wave function is worse than the real one. The real one is the best one that can possibly be because energy naturally wants to lower. Oh, sorry, nature naturally wants to lower its energy. So what the variational um, principle tells us is that if we have two different wave functions and you measure their energy and one of them gets a little bit lower than the other one, that one is the better wave function of the two. And you can do this over and over and over again to get increasingly better results. Mm. So in general, what that means is that if you create a function that allows you to modify it and you minimize the energy with respect to those modifications, mm. then you have uh, made the best wave function you can of that form. Yep. So the earliest um, computational chemistry methods and many of the ones today are... Uh, centered on that premise that you simply create a wave function so complicated that if you keep tweaking it, eventually it will become the answer mm. as you minimize its energy. Yep. Um, so one of the very first methods that came about to perform this process was the Hartree-Fock method. Uh, the Hartree-Fock method produces a wave function. It is not the true wave function, but it's a good enough approximation um, and it does so by making a number of concessions on what sort of uh, things it takes into account. So one of the things that you mentioned was instantaneous electron repulsion. 
uh, in Hartree-Fock, it models electrons as being waves, which is a very fair thing to do. That's true. Mm. But what it um, does in addition to that is say, we will simply measure the average repulsion between these two waves rather than tracking the electrons one at a time and asking at any given position, what is the repulsion between them? So that's the instantaneous repulsion. When you have think about right now, the electrons are here and here, what's the energy? Now they're here and here, what's the new energy? It doesn't do that. And that is one of the main concessions that Hartree-Fock makes, which is why it has some level of error. Hartree-Fock was very useful. It allowed us to do things like computationally solve the shapes of molecules. Mm. So if you put in uh, water, H2O, it will naturally bend in the way that it's supposed to. And you can provide some first principles evidence for the fact that water is a bent molecule. And then yeah. you can put in methane, and it will naturally form into the, the tetrahedral shape. Um, and that provides some first principles evidence for that. And then it also provided some rudimentary energetic values. However, the discrepancy between Hartree-Fock and reality, which came about due to that neglect, um, addressing that deficiency is the major goal of most quantum mechanics. And mm. many, many methods were developed beyond Hartree-Fock in an attempt to address that shortcoming. So... Uh, one of the ones, DFT, uh, density functional theory, is the one that I use uh, in the lab for the most part. DFT is probably, it's fair to say, the workhorse of computational chemistry these days. And that's because it recovers a lot of the error that Hartree-Fock has, but only for a little bit of extra computational cost. Every calculation has a computational cost, which is basically just how long it will take a computer to figure out the answer. And while we can get, I want to say that we can get a perfectly accurate answer using a, uh, using complete, um, using full configuration interaction and a complete yeah. basis set. Uh, I don't know actually if we have any algorithms that can solve full CI for any given molecule. We might be limited by the algorithm itself, but we do have a theory, at the very least, that can perfectly solve any system. But your perfect accuracy requires infinite computational time. It might so it uh, be not... beneficial to just to briefly discuss the hierarchy of computational mm -hmm. chemistry. So, hard you well, That's is... what I was getting to. Okay, I right, to establish yeah, yeah. establish that there's a cost and that you can get perfect accuracy, but that it comes at infinite expense. Mm -hmm. So that requires you to decide how much accuracy do you want and how much are you willing to pay for it and that causes the entire accuracy you were just about to ask about and we mean when we say pay we literally mean with your money <laughs> like no not with your money well unless you're paying by the hour for a uh <laughs> like cloud services from uh amazon or something which you can do yeah in principle nothing stops the average person from just getting time on an amazon cloud downloading the freeware Sci4 is free to the public, I believe, um, and just starting your own calculations. It would be a bit of a chore. A perfect energy rep uh, representation of water. That'd be a <laughs> perfectly good use of someone's time. <laughs> so the methods in general are organized by their increasing cost and increasing accuracy. Mm -hmm. So Hartree-Fock is near the bottom. It's not the very bottom. That would probably be molecular mechanics. Uh, but then above Hartree-Fock, we have methods like DFT and uh, perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. And then above uh, DFT and perturbation theory, there are methods like configuration interaction, um, CAS-SEF, which is complete active space, self-consistent field. And then uh, in addition, uh, CCSDT, which would be coupled cluster theory, singles, doubles, and triples. Yep. Um, um, CAS-SEF, that is a... Um... That is a variational method, though, right? That is a variational method, yes. And couple cluster, that is a perturbative theory, right? Okay. Or is I it? I believe, yes, yes, I believe so. Um, okay. That's just when you mind. have the per when you have perturbative triples, it definitely counts as a perturbative theory. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is technically described as when you have full CCSDT. Um, it's technically not variational. So That's I guess good. perturbative is the other uh, the other option, but it's a bit of a weird one, truth be told. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does 
then so DFT is a little bit higher up in the hierarchy. You mm-hmm. know, why is it described as the the workhorse? Like, what can it do? What can because it? Because while do? it's while it's relatively high in the hierarchy for accuracy, it's relatively low in the hierarchy for cost. Mm. And that's that sweet spot is something very attractive towards um, theoreticians and chemists. You want to be able to answer your uh, questions reasonably accurately, but relatively quickly as well. And DFT is almost always the best bang for your buck in those ways. Uh, one of the things that uh, computational chemists must learn to do, though, is identify molecules that do and do not work with a given method. Right. Um, so DFT is limited by two main cases. The first would be, excuse me, uh, the first would be regarding what's called multi-reference systems. And that's a little bit more than I think we have time for to get into. Uh, but basically, some um, some molecules require you to mix together several wave functions before you get the best wave function. And DFT does not allow you to do that. That would require you to use CAS SCF or CI. And the chemist must learn to identify those molecules that require that treatment and not attempt to model them with DFT. So just... We 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 don't have to go into the weeds of it, but just maybe some examples. So you know, di radicals, right? That is a something that is multi reference. Di radicals can be. It's a little bit tricky. Okay. Um, water, not water. Uh, oxygen, for example, is a di radical. Um, mm. However, that can be solved. Wa- hmm. Oxygen is perfectly solvable. Uh, what it boils down to, to use some technical words, um, it's okay too. If you have a series of orbitals. And you have uh, that are near each other in energy, mm-hmm. and they are not all equally filled. That is when it becomes problematic because you're going to mix together wave functions that move those electrons around into those similarly energetic orbitals. Oxygen, which is a di radical, is fine. So you have two orbitals right next to each other in energy, nothing else is really close to it, and a single electron in both. So they're equally filled and all is well. Uh, Where it gets okay. a little bit hairier would be, for example, with some organometallic compounds, when the organic fraction has orbitals that are near the energy of the transition metals orbitals. Yep. Once that happens, you have to include wave functions where the electrons hop from the metal over to the organic fragment or back. And oftentimes there's many, many ways that can do that, and you have to mix them all together in just the right way to get the perfect wave function. And DFT is unable to do that. Which is okay. Because many of the compounds that we study um, don't require us to do that, at least in our case. Oh. Uh, that's uh, that's why it's critical that you be able to identify when this right. this treatment is necessary and when it is not. Um, at the end of the day, most um, questions can be answered with what's called single reference methods. Mm. And that's very good for us because those methods are usually a lot easier to use. Um, and then briefly just define kind of single reference like what it so it's more or less the opposite i guess a multi-reference i suppose yep it would be when you do not need to mix together multiple wave functions to get the best single wave function could you could you Mm -hmm. say that electrons have explicitly orbitals like there's no each electron has an explicit orbital to go into if that makes sense that's a philosophical question right there um (sighs) <sighs> orbitals are a <laughs> tool used by computational chemists in order to create these wave functions. The wave function is true, and we have used the orbitals as a reference point by which to make that wave function. I forgot that uh, the orbitals are more or less, well, they are just uh, math equations that were made up yeah. using Slater determinants. It's not really a, uh, it, yeah, orbitals are. More or less just made up because they it happens to work out that way. There's not like nothing uh nature wouldn't describe them as orbitals, mm-hmm. I suppose, if that makes sense. They they're kind of made Which up. Which is by not humans. to say that's not to say that they are false. Right. Um, mm-hmm. it's that we choose to find the real wave function by making it out of orbitals. And that is the tool that we used to solve that math equation. Mm-hmm. Like we mentioned, the math equations are technically unsolvable, so we must have some way of approaching the true answer and the orbital uh, orbital theory is the best way we have found to approach that true answer which mm-hmm. is technically unfindable 
um, briefly. I mean, orbitals, because we've mentioned it before, their brief definition is just basically a place where electrons are. I think that's uh, <laughs> that is where they are. Uh, a little bit more nuanced. Um, it is a place where up to two electrons are. Two yes. electrons can share an orbital together and no more than that. Um, orbitals for single atoms are derived from the hydrogen atom. You can solve the Schrodinger equation for a single electron, which means the hydrogen atom is solvable. And when you solve it, you get a series of uh, solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And every one of those solutions was taken as the orbitals for atoms in general. Mm -hmm. And that is the tool that is used to create the uh, wave functions for more complicated atoms. Right. And then to create orbitals for molecules, you mix and match the orbitals from the, each individual atom together to create the molecular orbitals. And as we said, each one of them can contain up to two electrons, and they describe where electrons are located in a molecule. So when you have two atoms and a bunch of electrons are concentrated between the two, you would describe that as a bonding orbital, and the electrons in that orbital are part of what hold the molecule together. So they, in addition to providing a framework to so solve the Schrodinger equation for, they're also very instructive, which means that even non-computational chemists spend a lot of time thinking about orbitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely wanted to do a brief aside of that because it, it is quite important. It's literally what binds everything together. Yes. Um, so, but going back to it, so DFT is a, um, it is a single reference method. Um, mm -hmm. It's not well equipped to do multi-reference, which we discussed. Um, anything else you think is uh, quite important to, because I, eventually I would like to get into, uh, you know, what makes what are the fundamental math principles of DFT? Mm -hmm. um, how is it different than Hartree Fock? So the uh, the last remaining main um, deficiency of DFT is that it's mm -hmm. very bad at what's called dispersion. Mm -hmm. uh, dispersion is this interaction between molecules, which basically makes them sticky. When two molecules come together, they just tend to stick together. They don't want to come back apart. It's not a true bond. Bonds are much stronger than the sticky interaction. But if you properly want to interact how two molecules are in, going to interact with each other, this attractive force must be present for accuracy. Um, DFT in general tends to be bad at that. There are some exceptions, and within those exceptions is a whole bunch of caveats and technicalities. Um, however, this one can be somewhat addressed. Um, most DFT is dispersion corrected, which is when you add another equation on that is not technically DFT, but which yeah. adds those uh, dispersion interactions on as an afterthought. It's not a perfect solution. It would be nice to have a more sophisticated solution to this problem, but it does deliver accuracy and it does qualitatively produce results that make sense, like the molecules sticking together when they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so dispersion is, I guess one way to put it too, is is a non-covalent interaction, meaning, mm -hmm. right? So. These are covalent being a bonding interaction. Right. And it's in some ways how the electrons perturb themselves in real time and real space, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in, yeah, real time and real space. I mean, one easy example to kind of explain is, you know, uh, you know, drug molecules in our body and how they behave and um, how they orient themselves in the cell is much of that is dispersion. Right. So I think that's yeah. a quick little aside on that um but in, what the, is... in the enzyme pocket it will there's a certain shape mm. and the drug molecule will want to orient itself inside of that pocket mm. to best maximize the various interactions between the pocket and itself and dispersion is one of the many interactions it's attempting to maximize right so if you neglect that you'll never be able to properly model that interaction mm -hmm. which is another quick aside i mean that's you know many uh, medicinal chemistry are using computational chemistry and mm -hmm. it, mainly they look at dispersion. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what they, it, dispersion and, you know, hydrogen bonding is huge. Um, but any, in any case, um, getting back to DFT then. So, you know, what's, what is upgraded then from Hartree Fock? How is it different? So the, the failure of Hartree Fock, the comparison of whatever answer it got with reality is called the uh, correlation energy. Mm. 
Um, so what you were talking about instantaneous correlation, that's when it doesn't keep track of the energetic differences as two electrons move around, but rather averages those effects through a single wave. Um, DFT attempts to kind of add that back in over time. And it's a pretty clever little formulation where rather than attempting to model every electron wave at the same time, it concerns itself with the density uh, functional. Hmm. The density function is simply a function of three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, that tells you at a given point what is the electron density. Because electrons are waves at the quantum mechanical level, you don't have to think about them as being points or individuals. You don't say there's three electrons here, there's two electrons here. You can have a continuum where there's 2.7 electrons here and 1.2 electrons here and 0.13 electrons over there, where that just describes to you where the electrons are spending most of their time as they flit around the molecule and quantum mechanical mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and the density, uh, density functional theory, DFT, simply takes that density function as an input, which is a function of only three uh, variables, and spits out an energy for that density function. So one of the main advantages that they have, it has over hartree fock is that it has dramatically simplified the equation that must be um, optimized. In hartree fock you're optimizing all of the individual molecular orbitals, which means that you have to have... Um, if you have n electrons, you have to have n divided by two molecular orbitals, and each of those n divided by two molecular orbitals are going to be a function of three dimensions. So it gets out of hand extremely quickly regarding how much it has to keep track of. And DFT simplifies all of this. And in principle, that's not even an approximation. That's simply a different for formulation of the same truth, mm -hmm. a simpler formulation, which is often possible in mathematics. Something uh, that I was just thinking about in my head is for people to kind of wrap to, to kind of draw this back to the schrodinger equation a little bit is that like we can take this like oh my god like this can of soda right and how this mm -hmm. is held together the, in the yep. in the schrodinger equation there's nothing really stopping us from thinking about how do electrons in the clouds perturb the electrons in the system you know what i mean yes. because like in principle you you like there's it's unlimited like we and it's hard to wrap our heads around that like there's nothing really stopping you from doing from in principle doing that yeah, uh, quantum, quantum mechanics can be used to describe increasingly large systems up into like macroscopic systems. It allows for you to investigate interactions between here and Uranus if you want. Yep. But um, luckily, there's a reason you didn't need quantum mechanics up until we started studying the molecule, and that's because most of the time, interactions beyond the size of a nanoparticle simply Don't stop matter. mattering quantum mechanically. And there's even a theorem that says, as the system gets larger and larger, the answers of quantum mechanics must start resembling normal answers, the answers of Newtonian mechanics, mm. like F equals MA. And uh, I believe, yeah, the... Even like dispersion interactions, they quickly, very quickly start to become irrelevant. You know, like is it yep. one to the R over six, something like that radius? Or yep, that's exactly it. So as you travel R away from a point, the dispersion interactions between that um, point A and point B decrease as a function of R uh, one over R to the sixth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it. I mean, it makes sense in principle that. You know, DFT the electrons behaving as a density rather than each individually. It just makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So thank God that exists. <laughs> yes, uh, it's not a perfect theory. There were many concessions that had to be made in order to achieve it in practice. Well, mm -hmm. in principle, it can be perfect. It has not been accomplished, and that's one of the main considerations of DFT. With Hartree-Fock, there is only one theory. It's Hart the Hartree-Fock equations. You might find a more um, uh, you might find a faster algorithm for solving the Hartree-Fock equations, but there's still the Hartree-Fock equations. However, part of the problem with density functional theory is that we don't actually know what the mathematical form of the functional that creates it, that um, takes a density function as an input and spits out an energy is. Hmm. Uh, we know it can be done. There are theorems that demonstrate that such a functional exists. However, 
all we have ever done is approximate that functional in theory so far, which mm -hmm. means that now there are hundreds of competing functionals and you have to decide which one you're going to use each day when you go into work and which one you'll be using to calculate your system with. And half of being good at DFT is knowing which one of these functionals is the best for your system and what the advantages of drawbacks and expense even of all the, these different functionals are. So like the Hartree-Fock equations, they consider the kinetic energy of a system, mm -hmm. the electron-electron repulsion, uh, electron-nuclear attraction, nuclear-nuclear repulsion, same forces as before. Uh, but in addition, they have a section of the functional dedicated to correlation energy being the failure of, um, of Hartree-Fock equations. Mm -hmm. And basically what it does is say, okay, we know that there's some amount of energy wrapped up in these mo simultaneous movements of electrons as they try to avoid each other. What if we can find an equation for that discrepancy in energy as a function of how much electrons there are in a given space? Yep. The more electrons you pack into an area, the more they have to work to avoid each other, whereas <laughs> the less electrons there are in an area, the less it's a consideration. Then lastly, there's the exchange um, uh, kernel, where exchange energy is not... Not a real physical force. There's no exchange force. So exchange energy itself is a bit of a mis misnomer. Um, but exchange energy is sort of a consequence of several of the different math uh, mathematical limitations imposed on the wave function due to the way that wave functions work. Mm -hmm. um, we know exactly the density functional equations for um, nuclear nuclear repulsion, electron uh, nuclear uh, sorry, electron nuclear attraction, electron electron repulsion, uh, but we do not know an exact equation for the kinetic energy, the um, exchange energy, or the correlation energy. And by we know them, like you literally can go to Google and like look up those equations. Like those are, those yeah, have been known. The Wikipedia article on DFT will tell you the equations for the first three terms just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the same in every functional. It's the other. Uh, the kinetic energy has an agreed upon term in what's mm -hmm. called con sham theory. In con sham theory, we kind of bring orbitals back. They were made for Hartree Fock theory, but we brought them back for the purpose of calculating the kinetic energy in DFT. And we kind of put them aside again to get back to the density functional. So, in that sense, kinetic energy has an answer, even if it's not a perfect answer. Yeah. And then the exchange and the correlation terms are different from functional to functional. And yeah, so choosing which functional uh you you choose ultimately has a different correlation and exchange uh function mm -hmm. like how you handle that um yep. which can get pretty uh dicey and very complicated really quickly um there are entire <laughs> reviews dedicated to the topics of which ones are the best is there one singular best one or should you be using different ones for different scenarios mm -hmm. is it bad that we keep making more should like what is the direction for the field? Like how are we going to make new ones? Given that we've never made a perfect one yet. What instead of going down that rabbit hole, um, why don't we just say you know, what are some of your go-to functionals, and mm -hmm. what are they good at? Like what what are yeah. they good at modeling? So the one that I use the most is B3LIP D3, where D3 mm -hmm. is that dispersion correction I was mentioning before. Uh, B3LIP is the workhorse of DFT within the entire uh, chemistry world. Uh, there are a lot of computational chemistry experts that would probably not like me saying that uh, because it was developed in the 80s, so it's old. Um, and it has deficiencies for sure, but part of the complexity is that for any given scenario, different functionals are good at different things, and what I like about B3LIP is that it is, in general, good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just want to find out why something works, or if you want to find out if reaction A or reaction B is easier, it can provide you solid answers to that. And there's very few scenarios where this is simply an unacceptable solution to this question. Um, because of the fact that we work in organometallics, I need that generality. Because a lot of the times, when you look into what, like specifics, one functional can be good at organic chemistry, and then one functional is good at inorganic chemistry. And obviously, right. neither one of those is an acceptable solution to an organometallics uh, problem. Um, 
Like the Somebody Minnesota functions, side. right? The Minnesota are not good at metallic or metals, right? Or transition metals, right? So that depends. Uh, the mm -hmm. Minnesota functionals, especially the MO6 suite, um, there are a whole collection of functionals that were designed with different purposes, and you need to know which one's good for what. Mm -hmm. So uh, MO6 2X, which is one of the main workhorses of DFT besides B3LIP, is completely unacceptable for organometallic chemistry. And that's because MO6-2X was designed for organic molecules. It was never designed with inorganic chemistry in mind. MO6, one of its sister functionals, was designed with all of chemistry in mind. So MO6 is a perfectly acceptable function okay. for that purpose. Good, good distinction. Uh, then there's even two more that a lot of people don't talk about very much. Um, MO6-HF, which is mostly used for some of the more obscure topics like... Um, charge transfer complexes, electronic mm. excited states. Uh, Peter could actually potentially use MO6HF, funny enough, uh, <laughs> in his research. And then uh, MO6L, which dramatically simplifies the mathematics of MO6. It uses the same group of molecules um, as its test set, but as mm. far as what it's supposed to be working on. Um, but the mathematics at its core are a lot simpler, which means it's much faster, but also less accurate. Mm. So I actually use MO6L quite a bit because not I don't always need or can't afford the expense of B3LIP. There are times where I just need my molecule to be a little bit more accurate or just like shaped a little bit better before moving on to some final step. And MO6L is a great functional for those sorts of purposes. Oh. Um, Interesting. Speaking of Minnesota functionals, MN15 is one of uh, the later ones developed by Donald Trular, the developer of the Minnesota suite. Uh, MN15 is kind of like MO6 where it's designed with everything in mind, but it's nine years uh, younger. Right. MO6 was 2006, MN15 for 2015. Mm. Uh, do you want to briefly – I actually want to get into uh, the B3LIP, uh, the math on it, because – yeah, I think it's quite interesting. Um, oh, the well, Becky no, three, the, the Becky three, yeah. something, something, something. I forget what the love stands for, but I, I can, I can simply, I can summarize it. But I'm not the best person for interpreting the mathematics of B three lip itself. That's what okay. I, I mean, you. you know, part of it is some yeah. people they can just look the stuff up too. But I'm generally curious. Mm -hmm. So for me. I do consider myself an expert at um, the use of density functional theory. Um, and for me, one of the important parts is understanding what the takeaways of a functional are. So I will summarize those takeaways for you rather than talking about the exact mathematics at play. That's fair. So B3LIP stands for uh, BECA3. It's a three-parameter BECA exchange functional. Uh, Li Yang and Par, the Li Yang and Par correlation functional. Mm. So it's the union of those two different functionals that deal with, deal with two the two unsolved portions of DFT. So B3 lip, I'm uh, sorry, B3 is a hybrid GGA is the taxonomy that would be used in the field. Yeah. A GGA means that it uses not just the density function equation but also its derivative. And it uses that derivative to sort of infer what's happening a little bit farther away from a given point. So that if the density is dropping, like if you're at the edge of a molecule and the farther you go away from the molecule, the less density there will be, it can take into account the fact that the uh, the density is dropping right now when calculating the energy at that point. Yep. Uh, the hybrid portion means that it actually brings in a little bit of hartree fock theory. It's a hybrid of DFT and hartree fock In hartree fock the exchange term is calculated with what's called a double integral. It integrates the exchange energy over all space, and it evaluates the interaction between two different points at a time, mm -hmm. and evaluates every interaction between any two points in space. So it's a very long and complicated integral. But... What that means is that it's capable of considering how any two points in space will interact with each other, which is important for long-range interactions, like if two different molecules are approaching each other, or if you're pulling a bond apart. Once those two atoms start to become more and more separated, you need that double integral to properly evaluate the interactions between those two points in space when they're so critical to whatever question you're asking. All right. 
uh, normal DFT only considers exchange energy as a single point in space, and it just evaluates every point in space and adds up all those energies. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, when you have two molecules coming together or pulling apart from each other, uh, pure DFT is not aware of the other portion of the molecule and can't take it into account in its equations. Yeah. So the hybrid theory allows you to simultaneously benefit from DFT while also getting that long-range interaction that you're normally missing from it. So I would say the that's the main consideration. Uh, honestly, exchange is most of the um, time that I spend worrying about DFT because mm. correlation tends to be a little bit more of a tricky one. Um, I'll be completely honest with you. I read the Li Yang and Parr paper, paper on lip. I don't understand a word. <laughs> and that's okay. And that happens. There are there the functionals all have different levels of complexity. LIP is a fairly complex correlation functional, whereas, for example, the uh, B97 correlation functional was a little bit more transparent. I can understand that one a little bit easier. It definitely is very – it's very hard to – it's very hard to balance. One is – well, especially you coming from a predominantly – actually, in fact, pretty much only experimental group to learning computational chemistry. So it's like how mm. – how, it's something you always got to be asking – is how far deep into the woods in math do we really need yes. to get to understand this, you know? Um, For me, the answer is as far as I can get because of the fact that the most general answer is someone should know the answers to these questions. Yeah. Because if, well, the, one of the easier ones would be we talked about how some molecules can be evaluated with DFT and some cannot. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to be able to make that judgment call. That person doesn't need to be you. It is okay if there's someone in your university that you just go to and you're like, hey, could you just look at this molecule and tell me if I'm allowed to use DFT on it? Right. And they'll either give you a hard yes or no answer, or they'll give you some sort of test to go do that will tell you whether or not it's an acceptable molecule for DFT. And um, for a lot of my career, I didn't have someone to kind of fall back on for that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I learned it myself so I could answer those questions. So I can answer other questions as well, like what functional should I be using out of these 200 plus functionals? Yeah. Because, you know, we've, I, uh, the reason I started using B3LIP was because a former graduate student, uh, Long Wong, taught me to. Yeah. And I just kind of went, okay, sure. If you taught me to do it, I will do it. And eventually it just bothered me that I didn't know why, and that no one could tell me why. So I learned. Yeah. Luckily for us, you know, pretty much all, like, at least I would need to know about the mathematics of it. I mean, even some of the stuff that you explained to me, like, I don't even have to know. <laughs> like, uh, that's, that's the way the expertise needs to work. Like, right. uh, you need to have someone who can answer your questions. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know everything. You need to be able to answer the questions that people might ask you, and you need to have someone else to answer the questions that you might have. And as long as you have both of those things addressed, you know enough. Mm -hmm. uh, anything, What? how do you think we could start integrating, you know, computational chemistry better at like an earlier age? Do you think that there's anything inherently wrong with introducing computational chemistry um, earlier because i know that a lot of the fundamental mm -hmm. i mean the fundamental principles i guess get introduced in physical chemistry PK. yeah yeah physical chemistry is definitely where you start to learn a lot of the fundamental principles behind why like where not just dft but especially things like hartree fock what's yeah. going on there as a matter of fact uh, the chapter that we ended on in my quantum mechanics class in pchem 2 was i've it was either one or two chapters before Hartree Fock, mm -hmm. which is in my PCAM textbook. Um, so as far as understanding the mathematics of it goes, it's like being able to kind of do the calculations yourself if you know how to code Python or something. Um, I think that's still a, uh, like a graduate level class. Yeah. PCAM 2 is the prerequisite to starting down the path of an expert computational chemist. Mm. And there's now, certainly... I think it... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think it could be used much earlier than that in undergraduate mm -hmm. chemistry um, because undergraduates don't need to know why they're using B3 lit T3 today. They can just be told, like, this, uh, you can specialize in this and learn to make your own decisions right there. Right. However, 
for the purposes of this class, these are the settings that you'll use and you'll learn to solve some interesting equations, uh, interesting questions with them. This would introduce people a little bit more naturally, I think, to things like molecular geometry, yeah. because most of your undergraduate career, you're just told methane is tetrahedral, water is bent, ammonia is pyramidal, and you just kind of internalize that and people hold up a lot of three-dimensional model kits and you just kind of like learn what those words mean and you move on. Yeah. But despite the fact that structure is so incredibly important to chemistry, almost no one ever interacts with raw structural data mm. at an undergraduate level. And I think a lot of students really benefit from that, seeing things like, okay, here is the energy function as you pull this bond apart. Here is the energy function for these two molecules coming together to form that uh, dispersion contact or... Okay, yes, normally we would say this is tetrahedral, but because one of these groups is really big, I can see how it's distorted the molecule into a less than perfectly tetrahedral geometry. So you get to kind of familiarize yourself with these complexities and these imperfections that are inherent to chemistry. And I think something that's also really beneficial is this is not a uh, particularly an ad for the Schrodinger sweep, but what I do like about it is how well it, I mean, it just looks nice and it's able to yeah. model the molecular orbitals, I think. So I think for many students, like actually seeing these things in three dimensions really goes a long way, I think. Um, because it's hard. I mean, when you take organic one and two, you for most of the time it's 2D. And you mm -hmm. maybe sometimes you have a model set, but I mean, it's not it's not the same, I think. Yeah. Um, Which uh, regarding your comments, so Schrodinger's uh, suite is really nice as far as the aesthetics go. Uh, for anyone who cares to know there are many different suites available yeah. to you. Schrodinger is a paid one. It's relatively expensive. But there's also, for academic users, um, Gaussian, which is also paid, and Orca, which is free. I don't know about Turbomol. There's lots of different softwares out there. There's lots of different programs for visualizing these things. Mm -hmm. the, little, the little plug I'm going to give right now after you plugged uh, <laughs> Schrodinger there are free softwares out there. You can do computational chemistry entirely free, and it's even cutting edge. It's possible. Where can it will be less pretty? <laughs> That's okay though. Where can someone you know start doing computational chemistry? Like, do they have to? Obviously, taking PCHEM would be helpful, but mm -hmm. I mean, even for like a high schooler, like, where can they learn about this stuff? Oh, right? high school is tricky. Um, when I say that you. That, you can do it for free. Uh, university access is usually what you need. So Orca, for example, is free for all university users, whether or not you are a PI, whether or not you have an existing project. If you have a university email, you sign up, you download the suite, you're done. I was going to say, computational sure. chemistry might be a little bit too eh, Well, you know, some people are ambitious in mm. high school, but... I would I like to... I would like to be able to let ambitious high school students, and I think it would mostly be for ambitious high schoolers, yeah. to sort of interact with that, to see the uh, like the the orbitals at play. Because you start learning about orbitals in high school chemistry, you touch on them, see them at play in a more realistic fashion, uh, see the molecules in three-dimensional, which is a very new idea for them at that point. Uh, usually in high school, you learn about um, like standard enthalpies of bonds. You'll learn like a CH bond has this enthalpy and a CC bond has this enthalpy. And seeing how that's solved in the real world with a, with a computer, it'd be quite interesting and satisfying for them. Right. I don't know what that would look like, though. Um, I'm sure at least one software is free for everyone to use. Mm. But I've never looked into how would I teach someone computational chemistry using only freeware and a Gmail address. Yeah, that's uh that would be pretty pretty difficult. Um yeah, it's another layer of difficulty. It might be possible though. I don't I it's just not something I'm familiar with as far as that specific list of criteria. Yeah, so yeah, it might it might just might just be easier to do it at the university level. Um mm -hmm. which you know which is where most people start getting ready for it because Gen Chem one and two is where you really start learning about things like orbitals and structures and geometries. Yeah, I, I specifically remember Gen Chem one learning about the bonding orbitals and mm -hmm. anti bonding orbitals. That's where I explicitly remember it. And I gotta be honest, even for myself, like as someone who was like moderately intuitive in chemistry i mean bonding orbitals are tough like that is it's still yeah 
it is I thought theory is the molecular orbital theory is a tough subject it's the perhaps the most satisfying theory at the core of chemistry mm -hmm. but it takes practice it takes familiarization and you're right having access to software that can give you concrete real world numbers for this uh sophisticated theory could really help you kind of get more intuitive with it mm -hmm. i don't think it's a magic bullet though you're not going to understand bonding and anti-bonding orbitals until you just kind of smash your face against enough textbooks if i'm going to be <laughs> honest the great what's the the oh man physical chemistry and molecular approach um <laughs> <laughs> that is like the holy bible i think it looks like uh, a bible honestly they should, re they should replace like a bible they it's... should replace all the bibles in the hotels with uh with physical chemistry <laughs> and molecular approach <laughs> don't do that <laughs> not not that you need... uh textbook but one of my favorite uh physical chemistry textbooks begins with the commentary that uh the founder of um statistical mechanics killed himself yeah and then his his prize student also did the same and now it's our turn to start learning statistical mechanics <laughs> like oh yeah dude. that happened <laughs> i mean there it is crazy though apart from de broglie who's the most handsome physicist probably ever he's probably the most handsome scientist <laughs> he, ever he looks, he's a pretty good looking dude i don't get it <laughs> um yeah if people just look up the what's his first name antoine what's his first name just look up De Broglie. Just look Louis. up De Broglie. Louis De Broglie. Uh, look up Louis De Broglie and on Google. I'm not making any promises about the pronunciation of De Broglie. Yeah, he's French, so you know, don't you know, don't come crying to us, uh, Italian. I'm just German. going to presume. I'm just going to presume that it's De Broglie. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of those physicists, many of them have horrible lives. Like we're not kidding. Like this is not a. <laughs> it depends on the field. Stat mech, yes. Most of them are pretty physical. Oh, like horrible lives. I'm gonna be honest. Quantum mechanics, they there's they're just an odd bunch. You got yeah. everyone from like partiers and womanizers to depressives to like the Isaac Newton, I haven't left this tower in like <laughs> seven years sort of person. Like they had every sort of personality going on, and somehow they all managed to like get in rooms together and actually talk about their field to each other. And I will never understand that level of harmony because wow, those are some different personalities at play. That would definitely be. I think if I had you know if I had a time machine, I mean, definitely one of the things I'd love to go see is just getting to a, into a room with these guys and letting them explain these things. For the very first time, I mean, mm. you, it must be like tripping on acid. Like, you literally, like, they're talking about things that are so abstract, you know? My understanding is that they tended to get heated, too. They mm -hmm. they had some opinions, because quantum mechanics tells you some very dissatisfying conclusions. It's, um, that is funny, despite the fact that it's so mathematically grounded, it's very different from math, in that when you get to the end of a quantum mechanics the calculation mm -hmm. you might not like what you find out it can yeah. be deeply unsettling it can have implications about the universe that you just don't like one of them being that randomness is inherent to the universe the entropy um, term <laughs> it's just uh there was a i think it was einstein who uh yelled god doesn't play dice with the universe and yeah <laughs> turns out he does oh. <laughs> um but yeah, I uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, shoot. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, this about those heated debates. You know how quantum mechanics basically blew classical physics out of the park. I mean, mm -hmm. everything that we knew about classical physics up until 1910s. So everything mm -hmm. <laughs> up until that time was basically more or less set in stone. And then all of a sudden, quantum mechanics comes along and just yeah. destroys it and you know hearts were broken people died you know, <laughs> like it was a um, weird time for sure they they were under the impression that science was almost a solved problem yeah. um around like the the 1910s or so and there were just a few like loose threads to go deal with and it yeah. turns out those loose threads had some really dire consequences for the entire field of science i'd love to quickly discuss that those initial experiments kind of leading to discovery of quantum mechanics, right? So, cause like, mm -hmm. well, maybe like, maybe not quantum mechanics, but I remember there was, there's some experiment where like um, something about shooting 
gold beams or silver lasers and then they're talking about the the rutherford gold foil experiment is that but was that what i'm talking about was that the discovery of the nucleus okay that's okay but so that's not the initial i'm trying to remember it's it was like it was in the very first chapter of that of the physical mm -hmm. chemistry a molecular approach do you remember that experiment? Um, some of the main ones that would happen would be the photoelectric effect, which is that's it, what yeah. Einstein, that's what Einstein got his Nobel Prize with. Uh, what he found were a couple of results that seemed inconsistent regarding what happens when you irradiate a metal sheet with light. That's what it was. What okay, found, that's the one thing you have. Yep. What he found out is that if you take a light source and of a if you take the correct light source and irradiate metal with it, it starts spitting electrons out of it. And that was interesting. Okay, that's a thing that can happen. Um, you can kind of rationalize it. Electrons are held in place by electrostatic effects between the electron and the nucleus. The light is some amount of energy. You put in enough energy, the electron comes out. So you can wrap your head around it without quantum mechanics just fine. Sure. Where it got weird is that if you took a light, uh, some light sources could and could not cause this effect to take place. Mm. And what they found out is that if you took a light source that could not cause this effect to take place and just cranked it up higher and higher, there was never a voltage where it started happening. Mm. And the uh, the variable that ended up mattering was the frequency of light. So the intensity of light never mattered. The frequency of light always mattered. So, and what they found is that there is some threshold frequency where when the frequency of light was higher than that threshold frequency, the metal would always eject electrons. Mm -hmm. Once you were beyond the threshold um, of uh, the threshold three, threshold frequency. Mm -hmm. Wow. Threshold frequency. It's hard Wrong. to say. Threshold frequency. Threshold yeah, frequency. There we go. Actually, maybe it's not that hard to say. <laughs> no, it's not that hard. That was just me. Um, <laughs> once you go beyond the threshold frequency increasing the intensity of the light did have an effect um and what it caused was more electrons to come out mm. and then what they also found is that if you increase the frequency beyond the threshold frequency it did not cause more electrons to come out it caused them to come out faster the electrons just flew out of the metal faster mm. and this all seemed very weird to the scientists at play because both increasing the frequency and increasing the intensity should be increasing the energy that you're putting into the system. Um, but it looks like putting in a higher amplitude, more energy, doesn't result in faster electrons. It only results in more electrons going exactly the same speed as they were before. And it's just odd. And right. they spent a lot of time, Albert Einstein in particular, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what caused that. And the main conclusion they had was that um, light came in packets, what we now call photons. Yep. And that when the photon had sufficient energy, it knocked an electron out of orbit. And when it had higher energy than it needed, it knocked it out faster. And that hmm. each photon's energy is proportional to the frequency. So that's why when you have higher frequency than necessary, the electrons come out faster, but not necessarily more electrons. You're using the same number of photons, but each of those photons has higher energy. So it knocks the same number of electrons out and it knocks them out harder. But if you have a given frequency and you start increasing the amplitude, what you're doing is increasing the number of photons per second. Every photon that strikes knocks an electron out at exactly the same speed. But you, since you have more photons, more electrons got knocked out per second. Mm. And then lastly, if you're below the threshold frequency, those photons didn't have enough energy. When they collided with the electron, they just couldn't eject it. And increasing the amplitude didn't matter. All that ma meant was that more and more photons per second were hurling themselves ineffectively against the metal and failing to knock electrons out. And this uh, shift, where we used to view light as purely wave-like in nature, to viewing it as both wave-like and also particle light, was part of the advent of quantum mechanics. Yeah. And one of the uh, huge changes that happened, which was with de Broglie, was when it was discovered yeah, that matter also did the same thing. We mm -hmm. thought of matter as being particle-like, but not wave-like. And it turns out, like light, matter is both a particle and a wave. I think quantum mechanics is... Quantum mechanics is... is actually, I don't even think it's an argument. Probably the hardest subject, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. It's certainly up there. 
But that being said, the experiments that you can run to kind of demonstrate what's happening is some of the most fun and cool, if that makes sense. There are, yeah, you, you'd be surprised how, he, well, not you, you've done them, but yeah, uh, listeners might be surprised how easy it is to do a uh, quantum mechanics experiment with like a laser pointer. Mm -hmm. The last thing I kind of wanted to pick your brain about is, you know, the the future of kind of computational chemistry. So, we, you know, we, oh. like, not like, not specifically. Yeah, yeah. Not specifically like the math, like what is the 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 newest and best functional or whatever, but I mean like mm -hmm. applications wise, like you know, okay, right now it's certainly like modeling chemical reactions, um, and predicting reactivity. I mean, maybe that is what it's always going to be meant to be used for, but I was just kind of mm -hmm. curious to see your your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, that's not all it's used for today. That's yeah. what we would. That's what we as organic metallic chemists use it for. Um, one of the first applications actually was investigating, um, uh, wow, not semi-metallic, semiconductors, mm. investigating semiconductors and their properties. And it turns out the very early functionals, which were even more uh, error prone than the ones we have today, worked just fine on semiconductors and produced useful results. Uh, so it has lots of uses in materials chemistry in addition to the sort of small molecule chemistry we use now. Another application would be in drug chemistry, um, investigating the interaction of a drug molecule with its enzyme pocket. Um, there are a couple of other materials um, interactions that they can be that it can be predictive of. Um, honestly, I'm not sure. It's uh, at its core. It I mean, is that is. A, I mean, those are th those are three big fields, though. So yeah. You know. At its core, it's the mathematics of chemistry. Right. And as it increases in efficiency and as it increases in accuracy, which is what it's been doing for um, at least more than my lifetime, and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future, right. more and more chemical questions can be answered with it. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the uh, the answer is... The future is anything that you could do in an experimental lab and mm -hmm. quite possibly more efficiently and with a little bit more insight. It's just a matter of how long for a given question does it take before it's simultaneously accurate enough and also fast enough for your question. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why this big change started happening um, around the time that I got to grad school where like just the average organic chemistry graduate student could do DFT that's because it got to the point where it was both accurate and fast enough for the average graduate student to care about it. Right. And it's those two factors, the speed and the accuracy, will only improve over time. Mm -hmm. So by consequence, applications that it's currently not fit for will slowly start to become appropriate for DFT and become mainstream. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, as we move into this, we're in the height of this digital age, there's mm -hmm. going to be need for computational people. So mm -hmm. with that, Tony, I appreciate your time and coming on here and talking Absolutely. about computational chemistry. I'd love to, I mean, I'll be having these, I have a conversation with you every day, basically. So um, yep. it's exciting for me, but hopefully for the viewers today, they learned something about computational chemistry and learned something new that frankly, probably never even heard of. So yeah, it's a bit of a niche field, even it might be going mainstream, to uh, chemistry graduate students, but right. I'm going to guess that outside that, no one's ever heard of it. Well, thank you again for your time, and uh, yep. I'll see you. Thank we'll you. See you later, folks.